views uh, where he was. I think he had a, a few fields in uh, uh, the past couple of years. So um, yeah, that's what, that's what Mark does. Okay, so I uh, hope you can see the entrance report now. Yep. Yeah. Okay, so this is just, um, it's nobody's data, it's just showing the average of all the yen entries uh, from last year on the benchmark graphs. Um, so the beginning obviously shows who it is and what field um, and your amount of energy available and uh, precipitation. So um, Roger, do you want to introduce yourself? I've just realised you haven't introduced yourself and, and jump in if you uh, want to say anything. Um. Yes, hello everyone, um, uh, and um, uh, excellent that so many of you are on the call. I, um, I'm Roger Silverster Bradley. I, I sort of dreamt up the idea of yens um, back with colleagues in 2012. And um, as Ruth says, we've now got lots of yens, different crops, different places, different objectives, most of them about yield, but some about other things like we just started one on low carbon footprints. So, um, but it's a sort of really, we found uh, people very attracted to this because it's a, you know, it's not just a competition, it's a way of learning. And it's a way of learning together. So there's lots of scope for discussion. So, but it's sort of informed because you've all got your own data. So you can compare yourself with everybody else. And, and that really seems to work very well. Um, I think that's enough said, isn't it, Ruth? What? what yeah. um, <laughs> what? Want to say anything about the first page then? So here we've got your the grain yield percent of potential above ground. So these are the highlights, aren't they, really, of the report? Yeah, these are the sort of the, these are the headlines, and you know we try and put the headlines in the three three lines of summary at the top, and then we illustrate them with the box and whisker uh, benchmarking diagrams. Um, and, um, you know, sort of hopefully that helps you to key yourself in at, at the start uh, to see how you compare. Um, I mean, the, you know, Ruth, Ruth emphasized the, I mean, I think a lot of your crops are probably, Aaron will have to put me right, but limited by water as much as by solar radiation capturing enough water because you have mostly you have fairly shallow soils uh, compared to us and you have uh, probably a bigger water demand uh, through June July particularly so um, very important to sort of see how well you're doing with regard to water um, so you know that that next to bottom uh, diagram there. Um, I, I mean, you're doing, you, you, there's nobody actually sort of near the 100% mark, which actually we do have in the UK, which is quite interesting. So that it, it looks as though, you know, generally people should be able to capture more water than they are. Is this an example? This is a winter wheat example. Yeah. Yeah. Shall we move on to the next page? Yeah. Well, just um, the 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 heads per square foot um, is. Uh, I mean, if there's one thing to focus on, really, I mean, the thing we've learned from the UK is that big yields depend on lots of heads and uh, I mean uh, along with lots of heads you know the more heads you have the more biomass you'll get the more leaf area you'll have and the more grain uh, you produce so um, I mean I, I uh, often I find when we've got groups of growers that we we get to discussing how we can get the number of heads up I mean, in the UK, there's a big worry generally because uh, if we get lots of heads, 
the crop starts to wobble and we can have lodging. Um, I don't know whether you find that in Atlantic Canada, but but um, we definitely, if we're growing lots of heads, it means it's a, a bit more of a risky crop. It's more prone to disease, a little bit more prone to disease, and it's more prone to lodging. So we do have to make sure we're protecting the crop well. Yeah, I know we've discussed this before, haven't we, that um, tillering in the UK, but you're limited in Atlantic Canada, maybe is how many tillers you can get there for the number of heads. Well, and I mean, really, as, as I've understood it from you guys, that the number of heads, is, you know, the most important factor in the number of heads you get is the number of seeds you sow. Yeah, generally speaking, for the most part, uh, if we go, if we, I think it's important here to think about the number of true heads uh, rather than actual tillers and uh, not relying on tillers to carry you through uh, for the yield and uh, essentially shoot for that, that ideal po plant population that you're looking for. Mm -hmm. um, there's uh, quite a bit of work that the Atlantic Grains Council has done on uh, calibrating your seeder and uh, making sure that uh, you're able to hit those the intended plant population and uh, reduce some of that variability in the field. But yeah, I agree that the number of heads per square foot or square meter is absolutely uh, critical. The probably the most critical yield component that we're uh, that we're looking at. And and in the UK, that was a bit of a surprise to a lot of people because we'd all we've been working at about. Well, it sounds a lot to you, but we were working at our, our sort of 10 tons. We've been thinking 10 tons was a really good yield. Um, we've been thinking that for sort of 20, 30 years. And then we started getting people in the yen growing 14, 15, 16 tons per hectare. And um, they were doing it by, you know, instead of 500 heads, they were getting 700 heads, six or 700 heads. So, um, Getting that, you know, it's really changed our view of what you need to do in to get to get your yield up. Yeah, there's some conversion units uh, challenges there. <laughs> <laughs> Does anyone have any questions on the first page of the report? Or any comments? I think the conversion is ten, isn't it? Aaron, so that basically I was talking about six, five or six hundred would be fifty or sixty. Okay, yeah. So Roger, oh, sorry, um, it's Eric here, um, Ruth. I I wrote down uh, three things before I started: uh, heads per square foot, the message trying to increase them, <laughs> disease monitoring, how the yen could help us with that, and then the last one was. The end, this is the most common question we get is end rate relative to their yield goals, particularly in what I call a stacked program where they're using now fungicides and PGRs. Uh, that seems to, to change the nitrogen equation. So again, growers are looking for some direction there as well. So those are the three things that I had wrote down. Yeah, I mean, shall I respond, Aaron, or do you want to? Yeah, Roger, you go ahead and take a shot at that. I mean, I, you know, I, I'm always, I, I'm always conscious when I'm talking to farmers in other regions where I really don't know the, the, the conditions, to say it's a challenge to say anything that isn't doesn't sound stupid. But and and I've had experiences of bad headlines after I've spoken. So, um, like Palmy Boffin thinks we're 30 years behind with what I got when I went to Australia. But anyway, the, the, um, <laughs> the, the, the I mean, the, the yen assumes that you know how to control your disease. I mean, we do, obviously, we, we, we see the impact of if there was some disease, but we don't actually, um, it's too difficult for us to, 
sort of get everyone to measure their disease. So we don't actually have disease measurements in our data. Um, the the uh, and uh, so I, I mean I hope you're all right with that. The 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 lodging question. I mean we've put a huge amount of effort into research on lodging, and um, we've in in our conditions. Um, you know, obviously, tall crops are more prone to lodging, but we, sort of 20 years ago, we came to the conclusion that actually, in our conditions, the roots are the, the part of the crop that actually st is structurally failing more often than the stem. So when with our crops fall over because the stem sort of cuts a slot in the soil. When the soil is very wet, it becomes very weak and it can't hold the crop up. You may not see that so often. I, I, you may see um, lodging due to stem breakage more than we do I, in your drier conditions. But, um, but the way, uh, I mean, we, we use a whole lot of PGRs compared to you guys. And, you know, we can have people going on three, four, or even five times with PGRs. And, uh, and that's not just to control lodging. It is to control height, but it's also actually helps even up the tillers. So it's relevant to the discussion we were just having about tillers. Um, but then if we move on to Eric's nitrogen question, I mean, uh, obviously, and if you look around the world, you know that we've got huge variation in yields and the the amounts of nitrogen those crops need do relate to their yields but in general better yielding crops are more efficient than poorer yielding crops so it's not a sort of complete strong relationship okay and um but but in general you will need more you know if you've got double the size of uh, crop, uh, grain, uh, you know, the amount of grain, and most of the nitrogen ends up in the grain. So the grain is determining the final demand of the crop. About three quarters of the nitrogen in, that the crop takes up goes into the grain. And, um, and well, in our conditions, the sort of equation is, um, are we in hectares? We're in acres, oh dear. Well, the, the sort of equation is 23 kilograms, 23 kilograms per ton. Are we in kilograms? How, how does that work out? <laughs> um, so for, for if we're not talking, about, are we growing for bread or are we growing for livestock? It's mainly feed. Yeah. It's mainly... Yeah. Sorry, Aaron. As mainly feed wheat. Feed wheat. So yeah, yeah twenty three kilograms per ton, which equates to um, equates to about eleven percent of protein in the dry matter, or if you want it in, I think that's ten percent in uh, grain at fifteen percent moisture. So. I just and I just want to follow up, Eric. I think that the, um, I mean, the notion of of stacking. I mean, that's kind of where we want to be, right? Because we know that, um, you know, the higher nitrogen results in higher yields. Higher nitrogen results in more disease and more lodging, right? So I mean, it's you can't really just cherry pick, uh, you know, one of those three things and hope that it's going to work out. You, it might work out. You might get lucky, but. Um, the issue uh, so far uh, for us, I think, in the region with the um, with the growth regulators is um, we have such a compressed season that the timings of application are they're kind of they've been a little bit elusive uh, for us up until this point. So I think more work on uh, PGRs and timings, and uh, you know. Uh, looking at that um, uh, nitrogen response. And, you know, uh, sulfur's the other one. Uh, you and I had a little uh, chat about, about that, but I mean, sulfur, um, you know, basically at uh, uh, eight to one or seven to one of your, your nitrogen is, is critical. And, you know, like a base, um, 
uh, this might come up a little bit later in the 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 chat, but I mean, uh, most of the sulfur work that we've done in PEI anyway, we've seen a, a response in, in most of the crops. And uh, that's despite uh, what the labs uh, tell us is actually in the soil. And so the way that the, um, the Malik 3 works, uh, it doesn't really give us a very good idea of the plant available sulfur. So, I mean, that's, that's one nutrient that um, should be seriously considered when um, you know we're thinking about uh, about our, our fertility management but you know at the end of the day it all boils down to rain right <laughs> so um, and that's that's completely out of our control but you know we can basically do the best that we can and and hope for the best for the rain great thanks for that Eric Okay, shall we move on to the next page, which is the contents page? Um, don't think we'll draw on that one. Um, I just talked through the, these graphs. I hope they're helpful, but any feedback on those would be really helpful because this is something that we present to all of our YEN groups. So if you've got, we, we, we deliberate over these for great lengths of time to try and think of the best way to show this data. So anyone got any... Uh, advice or feedback would be really helpful. So then uh, moving on to the potential yield model. Um, so as explained in our end of year meeting about how the potential yield model was calculated, this is looking at the uh, total solar radiation over your growing period. And we have talked at great lengths about uh, the different dates at which um, parts the important points at which your crop is growing and then incorporating snow cover, which is something that we don't have to deal with as, as much in the UK. Um, so looking at how much is a, a, your crop can intercept of that light over the growing season, and then we constrict any growth by how much rainfall is available on each day as well. And we've created a winter and uh, sorry, fall and spring model that are shown on these uh, diagrams. And I think what became really clear to us is how much um, rainfall in June particularly are impacting these um, maps. And they also map really quite strongly with radiation as well. The weather data behind all of these models is from a company called DTN. And they do have um, MET stations across the world, but between those, the data is modeled. So it's not like being in your field and accurately measuring everything. There, there is opportunity to improve the data behind it, but it is the best be that we have because it has, gives us data from anywhere across the, the world. Um, so, um, is there anything else? I think, yeah, on the next page, yeah, so, so you can see the solar radiation, the total solar radiation throughout from September to August. So yeah, this report is focusing on winter um, wheat here, but the, these areas across Prince Edward Island um, map quite heavily onto the potential yields that we see. And the difference then being is the amount of rainfall that's available specifically during June. Um, which I think is actually, it will be shown, is shown later in the report. So maybe that's something else we can talk about. Is there anything, Roger, that you want to say about the model? Just a, a quick question, Ruth. There is a, a question in the chat and the question is from Peter Boswell. He's just asking, what is the start and stop dates for measuring the solar radiation? Um, so it's for the whole year. So for the for the map, it's from the 1st of September till the 31st of August the following year. Um, but the the crop, so for the model though, we have like specific dates. So for example, um, we say that the earliest possible potential that you could do is maybe plant on the 1st of September, but that crop wouldn't emerge then until the 22nd. So, and then it would only be intercepting a very small amount of light. And each day it grows very, very slowly intercepting tiny bits more um, until your winter, which we have in November. Um, and then nothing much is happening over winter. And then we have a snow cover that starts in January. 
so your crop then doesn't intercept any light and then when your snow starts to, to melt then the crop starts intercepting tiny bits of light again each day and growing more throughout the model um, when, until you start having rapid growth during the, the summer and I think in the presentation at the end of season meeting I showed the light interception curve that we'd created and how much it differs between the UK and yourselves and the, the spring and winter model. So I, I do have that if that's something that we we want to look at, but um, that's a general overview anyway. <laughs> am I unmuted? I think I yes, am. You're muted. I, I'm, um, well, just to say, I think, Ruth, the, the assumption is the soil's the same everywhere, which, of course, it isn't. Yes. But, and, and, and it sort of appears that actually where you, you, you're growing your crops, mainly where the potential yield is lowest. But uh, obviously there are other things going on, so there may easily be sort of completely impossible um, topography where, where the yield potentials are highest. You know, so it may just be forest, or it may be rock, or it may be whatever. So, um, it, the is, you know, we've had to assume the same soil everywhere, basically. Yeah, thank you, Roger. That's a really, really good point. Um, and we've assumed things like that. Your, if if you had inspired husbandry, you could get your maximum soil depth to sixty centimeters. So we know that not everybody is up to that. And it is something that we could look to improve the models for, for the next years, trying to uh, capture the different soil depths of the different regions. Um, and we also, yeah, so for that, then we assume that everyone is on a fine, what we determine as a fine sandy loam in the UK. So that is meaning that it holds 18% water in the topsoil and 70% in the subsoil. Uh, so that actually equals then to 103 millimetres of water if your soil is completely saturated. So that means that it's completely full of water. Um, so yeah, that is the limit of the model at the moment because that is the same for everybody. And uh, Aaron, has, Aaron has explained to us um, that the different regions particularly differ in soil depths. Um, so as we get to know more information, like Aaron did an amazing job uh, group this, this year, digging down for everybody's soil and finding out um, what rooting depths are. So the more information we get, and I think part of the project aligned with the Yen is also looking at soils across the, uh, the, the region. Is that all right, Aaron? Um, yeah, and I just want to clarify that I did not dig a single hole last year. Uh, that's <laughs> completely uh, Doug McDonald and, uh, he is our man on the shovel. So um, yeah, I, ca I can't take any credit for that at all. You've got a big soil project, haven't you, associated with this that's going to give us more, hopefully more information. Yeah, I, I, and um, maybe, uh, well, I can talk about it a little bit later on when we're yeah. uh, talking about the some of the other soil parameters. Yeah, and just to just to add um, probably too much information with the model, but uh, other things is like we assume 60% harvest index, for example. Um, and we also have minimum and maximum temperatures. So when the temperature of the soil goes below six degrees, for example, the crop stops growing in the model. And if it goes above 30 degrees, uh, also the, the crop stops growing in the model. So we, we have constrained those, um, those parameters. So is there, is there any questions about the model so far? No? Great. Okay. Uh, so these graphs then show the um, daily but, mean temperature. Can I just quick, uh, comment on it uh, briefly, Ruth? And yeah. I, I just want everybody to know that uh, this model is like, it's not static at all. This is something that like we're constantly revisiting and trying to, you know, improve. And uh, there's been a bit of a push within the Atlantic Grains Council uh, recently to try and improve the granularity of our weather data. And um, we're looking at a bunch of different options for that. But um, 
just so you know, these uh, weather data that we use are modeled uh, data, and we're actually looking at um, uh, trying to get sensor data um, next year. So um, this things are, are constantly changing, and, and as we learn more about the different uh, fields and the different production areas in the region, uh, then we'll be able to, you know, improve that that model and you know with crop modeling um uh you know <laughs> modelers are they're definitely a unique uh breed of individuals and you know they're really happy when their model reflects real life <laughs> so <laughs> uh the bit there's a big push on to try and get as much data as we can to make the model as real life as possible so that's that's kind of the goal but it, it is probably right to say aaron that that, that um, well, and I, I always feel very conscious of this because I've sort of we've had to say what does this model represent? Is this, you know, is this a typical crop or is it the best crop? Well, it is. It's almost beyond the best crop. It's it's sort of the, the ideal variety and the the perfect management in this weather and on the soil that we've assumed. So. It, it, you know, the numbers are quite high in relation to what you're achieving. The, the sort of proportion that you're achieving, I think, is similar to what we're achieving in the UK. So it's around about 60% on average, something like that. So, um, so we've got another 40% to shoot at, whether we're here or whether we're uh, with you. And, um, uh, but they are, you know, it's what we believe is possible. Ultimately, when when the growers and the breeders have really got to understand uh, how to do this energy conversion job that we all have to do. Yeah, and in the cereal year and this year, we had several contestants over 90% of their potential. And in the grass year, I know that we had someone who uh, reached their potential. So um, there is yeah there's opportunities to improve there isn't it with the model cool i, I might uh, just uh just and just before we move on um i'm just wondering if maybe uh some of the folks from like i i can speak with confidence for pei but i mean if sunny or um or peter scott want to comment on any any of this for new brunswick or nova scotia at all you don't have to. I'm just wondering if, you know, anything we've said. And Peter, go ahead. The floor is yours if you want to say something. I'm known for that, but no. <laughs> uh, I'm, I'm just starting to catch on a little bit of this yen. I haven't paid attention to it for a while. But okay. what I would like to know is what my yield potential is in the spring, not after the year is over or whether I was anywhere near. I'd like to know what my target is. I'd like to be able to take that to the bank when I want to borrow money to put the fertilizer on that I need to get that yield potential. Anyway, just as a joke a bit, but yeah. <laughs> uh, soil type and soil depth, I think is is the big, and, and uh, I think a question or a comment was made on millimeters of available- Your Paul, like a soil. You got cut off, Peter. Why don't you try to continue? I'm sorry about that. Yeah, no, I, I was just uh, curious. There was a one millimeter or something was mentioned on the, on the moisture. And we have a big uh, problem in soil depth and, and how much we actually have available. That's all. But you do know how much there is available, do you? We know what our top foot, if we had that in most cases, the maximum that it can hold, yes. That's good. And, and uh, I mean, you know, if you need to go to the bank manager in the spring, you know, he knows you're in a risky business. He knows you're uncertain about what's coming. But nevertheless, I would hope we could help you convert those millimeters into tons, and then you could turn those tons into money. So I, I would have thought we could work together to actually say something useful uh, for that conversation with your bank manager. Now, the, but the thing is, in reality, if the taps turn off, the taps turn off, right? And then 
<laughs> it's a three-legged stool and if it's not there if the water's not there then the the bank manager's not happy and nobody's happy so <laughs> anyway and Sonny, did, did you have any comments from Nova Scotia or Caitlin? I guess Sonny, right. not, Sonny must be quiet today. It's That's rare. Um, I don't have much to say. I just want to say when you mentioned like the taps turning off, that's, that was definitely our problem last year. Um, but I think we need to really pay attention to how we can build our soil water, water holding capacity um, so that when we get into that situation where we're just not getting the rainfall that we expect or that we want, um, that we're making the most out of, out of um, what we do get, capturing as much as possible. Thanks. Yeah, absolutely. It's so key and uh, something that some of our farmers in the UK are focusing on in areas where they don't have as much rainfall because we have such such different soils across the UK and such different amounts of rainfall. So it's a real big problem for some people and <laughs> then too much water for others. So. Um, OK, so this is your uh, temperature, mean temperature each month and your um, mean monthly rainfall, a oh, total monthly rainfall each month, sorry. Um, and your solar radiation each month as well. Uh, so that's just a general overview of your season. I think that's quite helpful in when you've had multiple years of being in in the end because if you go back to this report and see what you did here you can also take a look what kind of season that well can you still hear me okay uh a little bit you're cutting in and out there so i, I think we might oh, have grasped what i'm back now <laughs> okay no you're, you're all good now sorry <laughs> sorry about that yeah no it just had an internet issue yeah i was just saying that if you had if you were involved in the end over, over several years and you want to go back to this report that this page is quite helpful to see what kind of um season that you experienced for this report roger is there anything else you want to add on this no that's fine ruth thanks yeah, let's move on. I, I'm a bit worried about time, Erin. How, oh, yeah. we, how are we doing? Because we've got quite a lot to go. Well, let's let's motor through here. I'll speed up, sorry. Yeah, so this is a soil assessment. I mean, is this where you wanted to talk a bit more about what? Yeah, so we can, we can just kind of go through. Uh, we've Ooh. done quite a bit of work on the uh, soil health um, uh, assessment, and it's a brand new thing with the... Um, with the uh, PEI lab. Uh, the one critical piece of information that they're not doing, uh, which they're hopefully going to be doing next year is uh, water holding capacity. So that uh, one piece of information could probably replace a lot of uh, you know what we see here. I mean, it's interesting to look at the different components of the organic matter. And uh, it gives you a good idea of um, if you want to scroll down there, uh, yeah, and so you know where you lie with your your pH, your your organic matter. Um, if you keep going there, Ruth, uh, yeah. So active carbon, aggregate stability. I mean, a lot of these. Um, interestingly enough, uh, uh, we've well we've done a lot of work on this, and uh, a lot of these indices. Uh, either align with uh, your soil organic matter or your water holding capacity. So, you know, those two, um, those two measurements are kind of, that's really the more important, most important part of uh, the soil health assessment. Um, and yeah, and then, you know, f we, uh, we've compared the uh, soil health um, testing with um, a couple other different methods. And one of them was uh, just your regular um, uh, lab 
uh, you know, uh, soils lab. And we actually found, we surveyed 100 fields uh, in Atlanta, Canada, or in the Maritimes. And, um, and we found that the, uh, the lab analysis that you would get by sending it to the PEI lab or ANL or whatever, uh, had a better resolution for determining what good fields were versus poor fields. And uh, we found that the soil health assessment was good at picking up you know, good rotations but um, it didn't really tell you the difference between good and bad fields. So, uh, you know, informed decisions based on a uh, up-to-date uh, uh, soil nutrient analysis is, is really important. Is sulfur not on the report, Aaron? Uh, it is, Peter, but um, as I mentioned before, it's, it's a, uh, it's not really representative of, uh, of plant available mm -hmm. sulfur. And uh, we've, we've done some work uh, where we found, um, you know, this, the sulfur test could be reading uh, 25, uh, you know, kgs per, per hectare PPM. And, uh, and we're still seeing a response at uh, 25 added um, actual sulfur, sulfate sulfur. So, um, it's there, but I think it should be part. If you're adding nitrogen, you should probably be adding sulfur too. Um, for PEI, anyway, I can speak for PEI. That, that um, not so much if the fields have seen manure uh, previously, but uh, in PEI, that's, it's rare for us. We see sulfur in the grain as well, Aaron. Yep. I'm going to hand this page over to you, Aaron. Because oh, yeah. OK, so if you just want to scroll up just a little bit, uh, these are just the varieties that were used or yeah, the other way. There we go. The varieties that were used. We've seen a um, uh, uh, definitely a shift. Uh, growers are, are uh, looking at some of the newer varieties, which is really good because um, a lot of time and effort goes into evaluating these varieties uh, in Atlanta, Canada, and there's like there is a lot of work that goes into uh, um, pulling out that recommended list, and we're we're in the process of um, uh, of uh, reevaluating how we uh, measure uh, these these varieties uh, in the region. And uh, that's something Dan McCacker and I are working on. But um, uh, the thing to keep in mind here is these uh, those error bars. Uh, Ruth, I don't know if you could just point to them there, but anything without an, an error bar, uh, you can't really trust the result uh, because it's uh, it's only a single um, a single field, right? So um, basically. You know, the general rule of thumb, uh, and personally, I have to see at least 30 of something before I believe it. So, uh, you know, you want to see a, a good error bar uh, around that, that mean before, um, uh, before you um, take it seriously. Now, um, that being said, uh, these top varieties are uh, ones that, that were rated very highly in the uh, recommended guide uh, so far. And as we get, get more years um, under our belt, then uh, those results become, uh, uh, I guess, more, more trustworthy or more reliable. Uh, any comments on the varieties or questions about it? I presume everybody can get hold of the trials results that compare all these varieties, Aaron? Yeah, the, it's, uh, it's either mailed out. I see Heather's not at her desk. I don't know if it's mailed out or uh, if it's in an insert or... Peter, do you know where it's available online? I know that. Yeah, no, it's it's we've gone away from mailing it out to everybody and it's okay. just available online, okay. whether it be the province or like AGC's website. Okay. Yeah, we had uh, Mark from the UK come out to Prince Edward Island last year and he was talking about trialing some different varieties on his land, didn't he? Like just some little plots trialing different varieties on what worked best. Yeah. What was a good idea? 
Okay. But what, Aaron, do you know what the, I mean, if we compare A.G. Watson with, um, well, one of the more modern varieties, do you know what the sort of yield difference would be in the trials? Would it be 5%, 10%, 1%? Um, well, Walton's been around, it's been around a while and uh, people who grow it um, for the most part know how to grow it really well. So they're very used to using those varieties. Um, you know, when, uh, and you know, Peter's been in it the longest. Peter is probably a good person to comment on that. I mean, he's got at least 30 years uh, in on these trials. Um, do you want to comment on that, Peter? Well, the only comment I would uh, put in is the variety trials receive the same management. Right. And once those varieties go out to farm and they're using PGRs and extra nitrogen, then that throws things off totally. The, the variety trials are a guide as to which one compares on, a, on an equal basis, but that's it. Yeah, yeah okay. Great. Should we move on then? Yep. Planting day seeds per acre. Yep. So these are all, uh, these are essentially your, um, your management factors. And, uh, you know, it's the coolest thing about this is, uh, is you really get to see the, the average uh, and the winner and yours. And, uh, you know, it, it gives you a really good idea of the, uh, I mean, it's, it's not exactly a benchmark, but it gives you a really good snapshot on, of, uh, of what was going on last year and where everybody's heads uh, were. And so um, when we collect your management data, um, we go through and uh, put in all the timings and uh, figure out all of the, uh, the um, amounts of nutrients that go in. And we have this massive uh, matrix of um, the actual amount of nutrients and their timings for every single field. Um, and so this is basically, is all boiled down into one box in this care plot. <laughs> but it represents hours and hours of work. But this, um, the amount of information that we're getting from this is really going to help us to establish actual benchmarks. So the um, um, AHDB in the UK, uh, uh, they have a wheat growing guide and uh, we've mentioned it a few times and we've linked uh, to it. Uh, we don't we don't really have anything like that for the East Coast, and so we tend to take things from all over the place. But collecting uh, this information and uh, analyzing it at the end of this, um, basically, I guess at the end of uh, 2022, 23, uh, we'll be able to start to move in that direction and have enough fields uh, or site years, I guess, to look at how crops are responding to different management. And, you know, the, the, the really cool thing about it is, uh, this is this is farmer data, this is real data. This, it isn't, uh, and I say real data, like small plot isn't data, but, you know, I get that a lot, right? <laughs> and uh, anyway, that's, this is uh, one of the really interesting aspects about this, uh, this project. Okay, are there any uh, questions at all? You can see uh, when we look at our PGR numbers, um, that's the number of applications. Uh, so we're still, uh, this is very new uh, territory for us. Um, I think uh, with the fungicide, the number of applications, um, you know, the, the mean is around two. Um, that's, I think that's increased since uh, the previous year. Last year, it wasn't quite as high. It was, you know, similar, but it wasn't quite as high. So you can see as a whole, uh, as a group, we're starting to move towards more intensive uh, grain production in the region, which is kind of good to see. Okay. 
Now this, I'll, Ruth, I'll let you uh, explain some of this and Roger. <laughs> I was going to push it over to Roger, yeah. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> I'll unmute. So, uh, well, this, this is just showing you the variation in the, in the rainfall. So the water is very important in your conditions. Um, as Ruth already said, we assume that your, uh, your crops can root to 60 centimetres, and that means that you have 103 millimetres available from your soil. So basically the graph that shows the variation in rainfall is repeated in the graph that shows the variation in total available water. So that 273 becomes 376. So, uh, and generally the rule of thumb, uh, if, if, because uh, Eric was saying he wanted to go to his bank manager, if he, if he's got uh, 103 millimeters of water in his soil in the spring, then that should enable him to grow five tons of biomass uh, per hectare. So what's that per acre? Two tons per acre of biomass. Well, I mean that you're halfway there with that. So you you've got to then you've got to pray for. Um, you know, an, enough rainfall to grow the extra biomass you're going to need to get yourself up to whatever it is. I'm just trying to desperately look at the spreadsheet of all your data here and the amounts of biomass uh, for winter wheat. The maximum is five and a half. So, um, and that's per hectare. Is it? No, I think these are because the yields here are in tons in uh, are ranging from uh, up to three and three point six. From what? So I think that's uh, is that per hectare, Aaron? No, I think it's tons oh, per acre. Per, per acre, yeah, yeah, yeah. They're per acre. So um, we converted them all over. It was we yeah. calculated everything in base ten and converted it all over. Yeah, so uh, I mean, basically, you've you uh, you know, with your uh, your rainfall two hundred and seventy three millimeters there, um, that's you know, that's quite a lot of rainfall. That's that's um, enough to grow a big crop. Yeah, and then sorry. Go I, I, it's Peter. I just, you're you're coming up with a number, and as far as you're you're determining sixty centimeters, and typically thirty centimeters is about uh, the maximum, and equates to what we had as as done in some irrigation work, which was fifty mils of available water. The rainfall that's coming, and this is a personal observation, we are getting more than we can absorb when you're measuring this this uh, total amount of rainfall, right? Okay. We do not get, we do not, with our slopes, we do not get to capture the rainfall that necessarily gets recorded as rainfall, if you follow me. We're getting storms that are greater than what we can actually absorb in the time that it comes. Does it drain through or does it run off? It's anything over, <laughs> anything over a uh, half an inch at, a, at any one time will be run off. Okay. Yeah. Sorry, I went to I went to inches. Sorry. <laughs> yeah. Well, maybe we 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 better. Um, well, it would be nice if we could um, factor that into our sums. But that comes depends on the slope of the field too. Yeah. And and, and I'm throwing that more in New Brunswick than PEI. PEI is flat, so. Yeah. They get to they get to absorb all their water. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, and th I mean, this is uh this is a part of the the model, like we. And we're, we're struggling with, I mean, uh, PEI, Nova Scotia, New Brunswick are three completely different. Uh, I mean, it's a small area geographically, but uh, it, it's a completely different uh, situation. I mean, you throw uh, those crazy things like rocks and stuff like that in, uh, in New Brunswick. And that's, you know, there's, there's quite a bit uh, different stuff going on. But, you know, the, um, uh, so yeah, if we only have the 30 centimeters, and that's completely saturated, then nothing else is going to go in. That's basically what you're saying, right, Peter? 
Yeah, yes, and we, it, it would be good. Yeah. We, you know, we we should be trying to mimic that when we do our sums. So, I mean, if we could ask you as an extra question in our um, information sheets, what the slope is, that would be a, probably a way of improving what we're doing. Yeah, and then the added problem you have is in the in these um, maps here, when you get that rainfall, so if you've only got 30 centimetres and you get a huge deluge in one month, and then in a critical month where your crop is growing rapidly and needs lots of water, you're not getting anything, then you're not holding any water, it's, there's nothing left in that soil from the previous deluge of water, so it's a really yeah, it's a difficult, we're just pointing out difficulties with your season right now, how you're growing things. <laughs> so you're doing a great job. Um, so yeah, any ways that you can improve your soil water holding capacity so that when you do get a lot of rain, that it can be held for that time that you don't, um, is going to be a benefit of you, but it's difficult with the soils that you have. Yeah. <clears throat> Uh, energy capture, Roger, back to you. Yeah, well, the, I mean, this is, it goes through the same sort of process, but with the solar energy. Um, so we've got, uh, we've and what we've done here is to split it into three phases. So we've looked at October, November, so that's your sort of establishment phase. Your April to May, we sort of ignore anything happening in, December, January, February, March, uh, because of snow cover and so on. And also it's, it's very small. So, um, and then the solar energy in April, May, sort of 4.3 is um, terajoules. It's, it's sort of enough, if you could intercept it all, would be enough to grow five tonnes of Oh, we're in per acre here. So that's good. So we can, you know, five tons per acre and your June and July is enough to grow another five tons per acre. And then down the bottom, we calculate the percentage of that. I mean, we look at the biomass of your crop and, and work back from the sums I've just like I've just done to work out what percentage uh, of the total available solar radiation that your crop has managed to convert. So 20% here is actually very small. So you're, you're much further away from converting all your energy than you are from converting all your water. So in general, this does show how water is, you know, you're nearer the limit with your water capture, which was up in the 60, 70% of on the previous page. Um, to compared to capturing all your solar radiation. So you're, you're um, you know, you're large, I'm sure I'm not telling you anything you don't know, but, um, but water is driving your system. And I thought it was interesting that the winner here is way up high capturing the light com in comparison yeah. to the competition. So I thought that was quite interesting. Hmm. Okay, so a nice image of this is a this is a crop in the UK actually. This was one of our winning crops in the UK. You can see the number of heads here. <laughs> it's a very nice uh, picture, um, and a picture of your your soil and rooting depths. Um, and I really love these images. They are great, just showing you the the roots right down here as well. Um, okay, so the yield analysis. Um, so these are like the calculations that Roger was talking about. You know, if you can capture more light, you're going to have a bigger biomass. And, um, and in the model, we assume a 60% harvest index, which is actually what the winner here, the winner value is, which is interesting. Um, so the, 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 just to explain that the harvest index is the percentage or proportion of the total above ground crop that is grain. So this is 54% on this particular example and the best crop was 60%. Yeah, thanks Roger. Um, this is where the potential yield model that it uses 60%. So 
So that is achievable, but obviously not everyone is, is getting that. Uh, anything else to say on those page, Roger? Yeah, I mean, I, just to, uh, you know, 60%, actually, we don't have good, it's other than picking a really good variety, uh, harvest index tends to, it, it doesn't vary a lot, as you can see, most of the variations from 50 to 60%. Um, but um, the way you control it um, is, is mainly with variety. Um, but beyond variety, I don't think we can really, I don't know whether Aaron would say anything, but I don't think we actually can say anything. We just mainly focus in the UK, in the ends, on increasing the biomass and leave the harvest index to look after itself, having picked the right variety. Yeah, and the, like I'll just make a comment on the uh, the plant architecture in the UK. Like the, your uh, wheat plants look like our corn plants. I mean, they're different. They have leaves that are just kind of you know up in the air, just grabbing every last bit of uh, sunlight. I think uh, uh, for us the uh, the breeding programs. Well, first of all, they haven't uh, been specifically focused on Eastern Canada for or for Atlantic Canada. Uh, for a while, if ever. And, um, you know, we're largely driven by disease resistance, right? So um, I think this whole idea of plant phenology and the, you know, how the plant leaves, like the width of the leaves and everything like that, that's a fairly new concept that's coming into uh, the evaluation of some of these varieties. And, um, but, you know, uh, having seen the the wheat in the UK I mean they they don't even look like uh, like wheat plants like they look they look totally different so uh, that th you know I would definitely agree with you that it's variety that's driving that uh, that harvest index for sure yeah. yeah it'd be interesting to see how your varieties differ in harvest index of the yen competition you know mm. yeah. numbers be quite interesting to look at and then you, you've got your percent of potential yield here. Uh, so how you compare to our, our model of what could be achieved if it was perfect and inspired husbandry. Um, so yeah, as you can see, the average is around 60% and the, the median, the middle uh, contestants is, is just over 60%. So this is exactly the same as the UK. Um, but we do we do have a bigger spread actually I suppose. Yeah. Uh, yield components. Yeah. Well, the, the um, I mean I've, we've talked quite a bit about heads per square foot, um, plant height. In, in generally in in across the world, there's a sort of uh, belief there's an optimum plant height you you can be too short and you can be too tall and actually about 70 centimeters is is about the optimum so um i'm not i'm not uh, and we we actually find in the uk yen that the taller crops tend to have high yields um so maybe we've gone a bit too short but um but i i think 70 to 80 centimeters uh, is good. The number of grains per head, again, it's rather like harvest index. There's not a lot you can do about it. Um, I mean, your, your control over the number of, it's really the number of grains per square foot that you're, that you're managing. And uh, you do that mainly by the number of heads. Um, the thousand seed weight is, um, I mean, obviously determined last. It's um, it, it, it's interesting to to sort of look at that in more detail. I don't know whether we do we have the length and width in this yen. Uh, no, this year we didn't. Uh, we didn't have no. the student student labor to do that. But we 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 um, we sort of look in the UK yen at the length and width because the. The grain grows lengthways before it grows sideways. So, uh, and the length generally determines the the storage capacity of the grain. So that you can sort of look at the the length and the width and see how well the grain filled. You know, because at the beginning it's setting its potential, and then it's 
realizing or not that potential. So um, it's it's really interesting seeing that. I I mean I don't. Um, it's difficult to say from this whether um, whether you're sort of limited by storage capacity or by filling, and. Um, but I would say that your grain sizes are rather small compared to ours. I mean, we're up in the 40s here, grams per thousand. Um, and there is, there's quite a lot of variation because you're going from 25 to 45, aren't you? So that does imply that you've got quite big differences in grain filling conditions. Um, Going on to your favorite topic, Roger. Nitrogen. <laughs> <laughs> no, crop nutrition post-mortem. Oh yes, well, uh, let's, um, let's, I mean, I'm, I think we're sort of, we're using all our time, aren't we? So, um, if we go on to the crop nutrition, I mean, this this idea of analyzing, of sort of doing a nutritional post-mortem on the crop is actually very new, but and we're finding it extraordinarily useful. And we're, we've actually launched a yen specifically to look at, at, to enable farmers to do this much more broadly, not just on one crop per farm or two crops per farm, but six or 10 crops per farm. So, um, and, and, you know, the grain, contains most of the crop's uptake of the top nutrients in that diagram there. So phosphorus, nitrogen, zinc, sulfur, copper. So if you look at your grain analysis for those, that's representing what the crop has managed to acquire. So it's a way of doing a sort of, you can actually do a nutrient budget. So you can you can assess what your soils will provide. You can assess what fertilizes you you have applied and then you can see how much of that you've actually captured. Um, uh, so that's the sort of way we're going in the UK. But we've found, uh, I mean, particularly I've been involved in a lot of research on phosphorus and phosphorus analysis is really quite useful. We can detect when crops are going deficient. So if you move on, Ruth. So the protein is just uh, we, we measure nitrogen actually and then multiply it by 5.7 to get protein. So um, uh, less than 11, uh, as we said there, less than 11% protein is for a feed variety, it's indicative of uh, inadequate nitrogen supply. And actually, if you go over, if you go up into the sort of 12, 13% protein, that's indicative of oversupply. So, and obviously nitrogen is the most expensive nutrient. So that's really quite a useful way of judging whether you're getting your nutrition right. And, you know, I would advocate that you're looking at all your crops, analyzing them for, for nitrogen. Um, phosphorus, um, your values are, are really quite constrained around 0.3%. And that's about that's about the lower limit of where I would want to see it. But you have got one or two crops that are obviously going down almost below 0.2. That I would have said indicates deficiency. And in fact, it indicates quite um, significant loss of yield. Um, so if you're getting values down at 0.2, I would be well, double checking what the soil analysis says for that field and whether you applied any uh, triple supers or whatever you use and um, and trying to get trying to get, you know, if it, analysis is never perfect. So you really need to corroborate if you're analyzing grain P, you know, corroborate it with leaf P, soil P, see if they're low as well and start building a story. And if you're, if you're generally getting low P values, then obviously it, it, you can home in on that in your management. Um, potassium, again, your values are quite uh, conservative uh, and, and uh, you know, 0.38 is, is a reasonable value. 
Um, if you've got a few going below there, but not seriously below there, so I'm, I'm not particularly worried about that. Calcium, there's very little calcium in the grain, so we don't take a lot of notice of that. Um, magnesium, there's actually a really strong, it, it, well, there's a story coming through about in, in the UK conditions about magnesium and yield being related to each other, but your values here are reasonably good, so I'm not particularly worried. Your sulfur levels are lowish in, our, in my experience, and I don't know whether we, we have an N2S ratio, we do, and your N2S ratios are highish. So there's clearly cause for concern about sulfur in your conditions, I would have said. And, um, you know, the higher the N2S ratio, the worse your sulfur supply. Um, effectively so that those crops that are right up in in the 20s um, for n to s ratio are definitely cause for concern um, manganese doesn't look to be a particular problem because the, the lower limit there is about 20 um, there might be one crop that's below that um, zinc zinc uh, the lower limits about 15 so again i wouldn't be too worried about the micronutrients i would have said the main worries here are about um well nitrogen is always a worry and and nitrogen um you know you've got some crops that are down well below 10 so that does indicate under fertilization and you've got you haven't really got much over fertilization. I would have said, you know, that that sort of indicates that you're you could be under fertilizing in a number of your fields. Um, you know, and one thing that we found in the previous year, wasn't it, Aaron, that um, your timing of nitrogen was um, hugely impactful on what was taken up by the crop and how it impact how much that impacted on the yield. Yeah. Yeah, so I mean, the, the notion of under versus over fertilization, again, comes back to rainfall and, and available water, right? So that's, that was some of the, that came out uh, last year where the, the later applications weren't, they weren't moving into the plant at all. Yeah, yeah. <clears throat> and just a comment on the, the phosphorus as well. Um, you know, um, we, we have this uh, phosphorus index in our, our soil test. And um, so uh, it's still a work in progress, um, uh, but you know, for the most part, I think, uh, Ruth, could you just scroll up to the, um, uh, the soil health, even though it, it is part of the soil health assessment, um, it's on the conventional soil analysis too. Um, yeah, there we go. Phosphorus uh, saturation index. So uh, it takes into account um, aluminum, iron, and phosphorus in your soil, and uh, it uses uh, pH. So this is really uh, an important aspect of phosphorus management. Uh, in I know uh, New Brunswick has a statement about it in their potato production guide, and uh, and I I'm sure the potato people do here. I'm just not into potatoes, but I know that I've seen it uh, in the New Brunswick guide anyway, but uh, it's really, you know, uh, our soils for the most part have loads of phosphorus in them uh, in Prince Edward Island. And whether that phosphorus is plant available or not is another story. And so that's what this uh, phosphorus saturation index tells us. So uh, it says it right here, uh, if your pH is above 5.5 and your value is above 14%, then your soil is saturated with phosphorus and you won't see a response. So generally what we, you know, if it's in the 10 or lower, then you should consider adding phosphorus. Uh, but, you know, if it's, if it's higher than that, and I mean, 14 gives you plenty of uh, uh, buffer between 10 and 14, but if it's 14, uh, you don't really need to be adding uh, phosphorus to the crop. Uh, well, you're not basically, you know, as a scientist, we have a publication on this. You're 
percent likely to see a response if your percent is below 10, 10 or below. So that's that's as good as it comes for recommendation. Erin, it would be really good to look at our grain, the grain peas here and yeah. see how they relate to that advice. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, because you've got nearly half the contestants here above and below, right? Yeah. Yeah, so there's quite a lot of crops that should have had P applied. Now now look at the P applied, Ruth, and see if how yeah. many. So phosphorus, right. this crop, yeah, uh, right the, the winner didn't apply any. It doesn't say how many, does it? Well, it, no. I, it says a quarter, a quarter of the crops had none. Uh, the median amount to be applied was 20. Yeah. 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 So, um, well, it, it, I mean, it, this is something, you know, we, we now have this fantastic set of data that describes your crops. Yeah. We can now look at this data and see whether uh, we can improve on the advice that's been given. Okay. I think if I can just jump in and, and uh, make a comment, I think one of the stumbling blocks that we have in phosphorus, especially in Nova Scotia, is our, our soil test levels tend to be fairly high. Um, so we think that that means that we don't need to apply any, but if, if the timing isn't right and we actually need that phosphorus, but the conditions aren't right for it to be plant available, then we can benefit from the application. So I think yeah. I think that gets lost sometimes. And is the uh, do you have the P saturation index on your tests, uh, Caitlin? I don't think so. Okay. It's um, it would be worth looking into it. Uh, Judith Niranianza uh, developed it, and uh, her and uh, Dave Burton, mm -hmm. and. Uh, it's based on uh, survey data. So I think there's right. 400 fields uh, in Prince Edward Island that they sampled their potato fields. Yeah. Right on. Yeah. Heather, are there some comments in the chat? Because I just keep seeing it pop up. But um... yeah, there's, and I'm, it is from Sonny, but he's using uh, <laughs> short words there for me. So uh, I don't know if Sonny, if you want to turn your, your mute off and, and ask that question, but uh, something about phosphorus available in coal soils? Cold soils? Cold soils. soils. Okay, with fall yeah. planning. <laughs> when the temperature's <laughs> too low. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> yeah, I was just expanding on Caitlin's point there where we may have uh, lots of phosphorus in the soil, but we're planting winter wheat in the fall and we seem to be getting a kick from putting more phosphorus down with the seed. Uh, and I think it just has to do with availability in that cold soil. Um, we, I've experienced uh, cases where we had like uh, 2000 kilograms per hectare of phosphorus in the soil, but uh, because the soil temperature, we seem to still get that uh, yield benefit um, from uh, putting phosphorus with the seed. So if we look at your statement there, Aaron, though, um, if your pH is above 5.5 and your value is above 14%, then your soil is saturated with phosphorus. Well, nearly everybody's soil pH is above 5.5. So this is what you're, you're saying. Um, but we do have people with lower percent phosphorus. So, so what would happen in that scenario? Yeah, so in um, if it's above uh, 5.5 and it's, you know, any, basically, uh, if you're below that 10, then um, if you're 10 or lower, then you're 80% likely to see a response from added sulfur, or sorry, phosphorus, not sulfur. Even if your pH is away above 5.5? Yeah, yeah. And, and do you have a, do you have a sort of concept, Erin, of, um, the more you apply, the the more you build up the availability. Uh, no, that's that's not really like 
when you look at the amount of aluminum and iron in our soils, it's uh, it's unbelievable. So uh, yeah. there's a lot of things going on there. Okay. Yeah. Our problem's calcium. Right. Yeah. That's the other one. Yeah. Yeah. But that's all because we're mainly high pH soils. Yeah. Okay. So I, I think uh, um, we're probably close to finishing this up. Are there any... Um, comments from anybody specifically about the reports or any details that they need clarified? Hey, Aaron, it's Eric here again. Again, appreciate being able to be on the call. Um, perhaps um, as you deal with the solar radiation, maybe you could break rainfall into some um, quadrants or you know, by month perhaps. That might be a little more useful in interpreting the data. And the other one I came up with is because I had the PI University crew do a drone flight on one of my fields the, two years ago, um, not my own crop, but a grower's crop, and, and um, came up with some really interesting stats around percent lodged. It would be interesting to have the yen sites with a, a drone image you know, winter wheat would have to be at a, at, at a pre-harvest and the spring grains would be at pre-harvest. But I think that would be quite telling as well. Uh, those are just two thoughts that I jotted as Ruth and, and Roger were talking in yourself through the session. Yeah, thank you, Eric. That would be really, really cool. <laughs> have some drone, drone images, definitely. And we can easily present the rainfall as we do for the radiation. I, yeah, it's something that, as we were talking, came apparent to me as well, that we were saying that rainfall in these periods were, were, was important. We hadn't actually shown those in those uh, benchmark graphs. So we'll, that's a really good idea. We'll do that. Yeah. Does anyone else have any questions about their own report or any general comments? Looks like everybody's quiet. Yeah. Well, that, yeah. that could be, we'll take that as good. Like, uh, that means they understand <laughs> everything, right? I'll stop um, sharing then. We can okay. see everyone again. Perfect. No, I appreciate uh, Roger and Ruth and Aaron for your expertise again today. Uh, I'm glad that we've had a few farmers uh, on the call that uh, hopefully can, you know, reach out that report and you know, dilute it and, and, and answer some of their questions for uh, for the upcoming planning season. The only other thing that I would add is that uh, we are getting ready for 2021 yen. So uh, it is live on our website. So feel free to, to go online and register your, your fields for this upcoming season. Um, again, there's going to be the same crops available, Aaron, that we uh, looked at last year in all three provinces. So I encourage uh, my friends in Nova Scotia and uh, New Brunswick to uh, to apply and to get our numbers a little bit up uh, in those two provinces. So I'd look uh, for help from Caitlin and Sunny to uh, to do that as well. I don't know, Aaron, that's all I've got. I uh, just you know, mainly thank you. Um, I think this was a good overview of, of the reporting. Um, I know that both of you are always available for questions and I appreciate, uh, I appreciate that. So um, with that, I'm not sure, Aaron, if you wanna have anything yeah, else. No, uh, if if there's anything, uh, if anybody has any questions about the reports, don't hesitate to contact any of us. Um, we're easily accessible and uh, please encourage all of your, uh, your farmer buddies and yourself to, to enter the end. The more data we get, then the more powerful this is, uh, this is gonna be. So, um, uh, and, and Doug's gonna be our man again this year. So <laughs> anyway, uh, no, it, it's, um, we're pretty excited about working with this project. So we'd like to see as many fields as we can possibly get. Thanks. Absolutely. So no, with that, uh, we'll end the call for today. But again, thank you uh, to everybody, to my friends in the UK, continue to stay safe over there. And uh, we'll be thinking about all of you. And uh, hopefully this Atlantic bubble opens soon so we can all get together. But uh, until then, I guess it's a, it's a Zoom. So um, with that, have a great rest of your week and we'll talk soon. Thank you so much, Heather. Hey guys. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye -bye. Thank you.